Good morning. Good to see you all here. Nice bright summer morning. Um, quick updates here. A couple people. Dale said he surgery and he's recovering. <laughs> Still got to deal with pain, but hopefully this will cure the problem. I uh, don't know of any updates on Linda Lidford. She still was waiting for an appointment. Have you heard anything else? No. Okay. All right. Lots of fires going on around the country. Um, Lots of heat. Terrible heat out in California. That's where my son is, and he said it was 113, 115, and they work 12-hour days. <laughs> Terry, my family, Debbie's still in the hospital, and the yes. Sanders got double pneumonia down there, and they couldn't keep her in the hospital. They sent her home by oxygen and some medicine and to see if she could get better on her own. And we're waiting to see if she's going to end up in the hospital again. And then Deborah's still in with the, the virus. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And her and her daughter, oldest daughter, is not getting hold of very well either. But uh, Heidi, which some people know. Yeah. Yes, <clears throat> we pray for Heidi a lot. Okay. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And we'll start. Father, we give you praise. We thank you for today. Thank you for your amazing grace and your mercy. You are faithful. You are the Good Shepherd, and you know our needs even before we ask them. We pray for these, Lord, that we've mentioned some going through some physical trials and needs, Dale's recovery and Edward with the virus and her family. Lord, Linda Ledford, as she awaits some answers about the treatment. And Father, there's just needs in our land right now. We pray for those that are enduring these fires and other tragedies that have happened. Lord, we need revival, renewal in our land. We know that there are so many needs spiritually, Lord. We need to come alive to you. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. Father, we give you praise. We know there are still many blessings. We know you're still in control. We know, Lord, that your promises are true. So be with us as we look once again into your word. We give you all the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, just a brief look back at chapter 13. We're going to go into 14. Uh, 13, we're talking about the beasts from the sea, the beasts from the earth. And we mentioned that they were a, uh, a parody, really, a mimicking of God uh, in the sense of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the beast. Satan is trying to, wherever he can, he's trying to mimic that to uh, uh, draw people to worship him. And uh, we talked about the, the beast from the sea representing anti-Christian governments. And one of the things in that chapter talked about the beast having a, a fatal injury and then being resuscitated. And we said how that, that is an image of how the enemy is still working through history in the world through government powers. You defeat one and the next one comes up, right? So we got rid of, of Nazism back in the the last century, but then what rose up after that? Communism. And then we got communism kind of broke down and now we've got terrorism. So they're just one thing after another. You, you can't, the, the image there is, you can't completely defeat it. It's going to find another way to work his wiles uh, within and without the church. And then the beast from the earth uh, is a picture of anti-Christian religion. And how that works. He works through that tool as well. And isn't he done a good job of that with all the false beliefs? Uh, you got Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism. And, and those groups, those major groups, are fighting continually against Christianity. Uh, you look through the uh, what's going on in the missionary world and in the Christian world, they are just continually being oppressed. Uh, many of the places in India, even with Hinduism, constantly being oppressed. Uh, being put in prison or arrested or even killed over and over and over again. So that's the picture. That's the image there that's going on in chapter 13. And notice the, the verse there in chapter 13, verse 10. This calls for what? Patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. What did Jesus keep telling the seven churches? 
Be faithful. Be an overcomer. Don't give in to the false teaching of the Nicolaitans, the Jezebels, the Balaams. Don't give in to that. Don't give in to the emperor worship. Stand firm. Continue to be loyal and faithful to Christ. And I think the, the, we need to keep the key message in, in mind and not get too strung out with the details because these are images and symbols that we're looking at here. So that's a, that's a key issue in that chapter was, and it's going to come up again as we look at chapter 14. Then we talked about the mark. And what is the mark, really? The Holy Spirit. Well, for the saints, the 144,000 we talked about, the sealing is the Holy Spirit, isn't it? We are, that marks us, if you will, as His people. So the mark is not physical, it's spiritual. It's who you belong to, who you worship. Who is your Lord? Um, we tied that in, or John did, back to Ezekiel with the man and linen going through and marking those who belonged to God when judgment was coming on Jerusalem and, and Judah uh, under Babylon's rule. So who you belong to is the key. Now, we talked about a little bit about the number of his name. Look at the end of chapter 13. Uh, to receive the mark on his right hand his forehead, the Jews were to keep the scriptures in their heart. Now they took it literally by putting the scriptures literally on their wrist and on their forehead with the phylacteries and they'd write them out and put that up on their forehead and then they'd, then they'd have the mezuzah on the door frame with the Ten Commandments in there. So they kind of took it literally but the idea was that they were to be God's people. And they, their character, their life was to speak as a witness to the people around them. And that's what that was about. So to receive that mark, now notice that this name of the beast, the number, the name of the beast, or the number of his name, calls for wisdom. And we get this 666 number. Now we said that the Greek word for beast is the word therion. I know that doesn't mean a lot to you, but if you transliterate that back into Hebrew, and Hebrew used a, a gematra, they would Hebrew letters would would indicate a number. And so if you take the Greek word therion for beast, translate it back into Hebrew, and you do the gematria, it comes out 666. So the number, and that's what it says here. That is his number. The name of the beast is his, that's his number, the name of his beast. So the, the word beast is simply what he's talking about here. It's not a person's name. Okay, like people have tried to make it out. It's not a person's name. It's simply referring to the beast. Who you, it's, the key is, it goes back to this, who do you belong to? Who's your Lord? Okay? So trying to make that mean something else is just going into the weeds. Okay? Stay true to what the scripture says, and then we'll, we'll get a better picture here. So that's chapter 13. Chapter 14, <clears throat> John is seeing or looking again and before me he says was the lamb now where do we encounter the lamb before Daniel. well <clears throat> that term doesn't really <clears throat> mean a picture in revelation where do you hear where do we fear find the term lamb well yeah but chapter Five especially, and who's the one able to open the scroll? Yeah, the lamb. It's the lamb. So the lamb referring to Christ. Okay. What's going on here? They're standing. The lamb is standing on Mount Zion. Mount Zion is a term in Revelation, usually referring to Jerusalem or, in essence, God's people. And here's the 144,000 again. Where did we encounter them before? Do you remember what chapter? <laughs> chapter 7. They were described back then in chapter 7 as being those who were redeemed from the earth. In other words, those who have accepted the gospel, been baptized into Christ, have received the Holy Spirit, they've been redeemed from the earth. But where are they now? Well, let's look. Where are they? Well, they're, they're with the Lamb. The 144,000. Notice how they're described here. They have the name. They have the name of the Lamb and the Father written on their foreheads. What does that tell you? 
They belong to Him. They belong to Him. Whether it's the name of the Father, name of the Son, same thing. They belong to Him. Okay? Did the, you remember back in the Old Testament, the high priest, remember, he wore a turban inscribed on it was holy to the Lord. You remember our discussion about the commandment not taking the name of the Lord? What did we say that really meant? Not about swearing. The term there in the Hebrew is really that we are to bear his name. Not bear his name in vain. In other words, not. Because the word really means to bear or to carry. So we are to carry or bear his name as his witnesses in the world. That's the sense of that commandment. Okay? I kind of went through that in a while back, though. Keep <laughs> going. But that's the idea. To bear his name, to carry his name, is how we're living for him and that's what Israel was to do. They were to bear his name to the other nations, be his representatives, his ambassadors to the world. That's what we're to do. So that commandment's not about swearing as such. It's about bearing or living for him. But notice that they have the name. To have the name on the forehead means that your life is committed to him. Your life, your character is to reflect him wherever you are. So there's the picture. They're standing there. I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. Well, that takes us back to chapter 1 because that described Jesus in very graphic terms where John sees this image and hears the voice and there's the thunder and all of this going on. Also, could take us back to Sinai because that's where God appeared to his people on the mountain. And there was what? Peals of thunder and lightning and all of this going on, and people trembled, and Moses did too. And the sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harp. It was like that. And they sang a new song. Before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, we've encountered them before, back in chapter 4 and 5. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been what? redeemed from the earth. Now remember scripture tells us that we, Peter says we have been purchased not with silver and gold but with the precious blood of the Lamb. We've been, same terminology here, we have been bought with a price. That price was the gift of the Lord Jesus giving himself up on the cross willingly for us. So now the 144,000 are in heaven Again, representing symbolic of God's people. These are not Jehovah Witnesses. <laughs> okay? All right? I'd like to tell you that, yeah, that's the hierarchy of Jehovah, all that stuff. So John's using this description here. Um, and now what about the new song? Where does that take you back to? Any ideas? They're before the throne, they're singing a new song. Crossing the Red Sea. Crossing the Red Sea. Remember that imagery is still very much in play here. John's drawing on that as a picture. So when Israel went across the sea on dry land, the Egyptian army is crushed by the waters. What happens right after that victory? Yeah, Miriam, Moses' sister, leads them in this new song. And you look at chapter 15 in Exodus, and it's got all this description of how God just took apart Pharaoh and his army by the sea, and he delivered his people. It's a song of victory, a song of, of praise and honor and glory for their God, who has won the victory, not just over a physical army, but over the invisible spiritual gods who misled and deceived the people into worshiping the creatures, the frogs, the sun, the, all the other things that the plagues fought against. These, you got to remember now, this, was, this is a spiritual war, a spiritual battle that happened there in Egypt, and now John's kind of using that to point <coughs> to what's going on throughout history in the world now. So this new song that is known to believers to this 144,000 and now they're singing praise for a new exodus that has happened a new exodus that Jesus did by his victory through the cross 
and the resurrection. Okay, so the two symbols kind of picture them together because these are the two main events. Now they're going to describe it in a little different terms here. Verse 4, these are those, who's he talking about? The 144,000, those marked by God, those who belong to God. What? They did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were, there's this word again, purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. What is that all about? Why does He describe them that way? Well, they're men. Well, it's not actually, it's a symbolic picture. So it's not just limited to men. If you hadn't worshipped idols and stuff? Yes, it has to do with that imagery. They did not defile. Is that meant to be literal? <clears throat> See, we want to try to tend to want to make a lot of things in Revelation literal or bringing us to some future thing way in the future, but that's not the way the book was written. They What's, what's Jesus been warning about in the churches that he's written to? Go back to that again. What did he constantly warn them about? And what was Israel warned about in the Old Testament by the prophets? What did, he keep, what did the prophets keep warning them about? Remain spiritually faithful to him, right? And there were warnings of disobedience and there were promises of obedience and all of that was highlighted in the Old Testament. Prophets kept telling them don't give in to this Baal worship. To Malek, to all these gods, Kemosh. Don't do that. That's talking about faithfulness. Spiritual faithfulness. So would it make sense that this would be talking about spiritual faithfulness? Okay? So it's not about something physical here. It's about, are you going to spiritually stand against things like emperor worship? Was that a big deal in John's day? Yeah. Because you might be asked by someone in a trade guild to go to the temple and offer incense to Caesar, and they might be telling, this is the compromise issue. They might be saying, well, yeah, you go over there and worship your Jesus, but you need to come here to the temple and give your incense to Caesar and say, Caesar is Lord, because otherwise you're going to be in trouble. You're going to lose your job. You might be put in jail. That happened today. <laughs> Not Caesar, but okay. You know who he stands for. So that's the issue. Will you compromise your faith? Will you stand firm in your faith? It's a spiritual issue. So those, when he's talking about those who, in this imagery picture, he's talking about those who remain faithful, pure, and strong for God, for their Lord. Does that make sense now? I mean... Throw out the questions and the issue. You want to challenge it? That's fine. Well, I, I have a question. Um, could it have any relationship to the fact that I mean, these uh, temples worshiping gods that they had women prostitutes? In? Well, yes, they did, and that was a problem. That was a problem because that would draw them back into that false worship. So that may be a part of the picture here. Because there's that lure, uh, the prostitutes, yes, would, would constantly luring, luring people into these temples to do their, their worship because they did certain things, sexually immoral, immoral acts that were to draw attention to the gods, uh, fertility, for example, safety, prosperity. They, they were doing all those things. So that does figure into it, but it is a spiritual picture uh, I believe it is a spiritual picture. Now, it also, this is kind of an interesting, it, it also could be, a, because this is spiritual warfare, and this might also be a picture of a, a spiritual army, if you will. Because in a sense, in the Old Testament, Israel was God's spiritual army, weren't they? What are they dealing with? All the evil around them in these nations that was corrupted by the false being. So in a sense, this can be pointing to a spiritual battle here. Uh, with God's, as you will, heavenly, earthly army against the army of Satan uh, in the spiritual realm. So in, in that sense, there was a regulation for uh, when, when war was taking place that demanded 
sexual abstinence before battle. Um, do you remember the account of David and uh, Uriah? He was involved with Bathsheba and Uriah came back and, and David's trying to get him to do what? <laughs> go home. Go be with your wife. And what does he do? He says, no, I can't do that. My soldiers are out on the field. I can't go and enjoy being with my wife and they can't do that. Out there. And so there's this, there's this kind of background imagery of of uh, a spiritual warfare, if you will, spiritual army going on here in the picture too. But basically, the big picture is, I think, is that uh, as you tie it all together, those who have stood strong, notice what it says in the rest of the verse there. What's the issue there? They're following the Lamb. Okay? So it has to be something spiritual involved here. They're following the Lamb wherever He goes. That's toward the end of verse 4. And they are those who have been bought with a price by the blood of Christ, purchased, and they are now kind of the picture of the first fruits. Well, that's often said in the Old Testament. They're the first fruits of, of God's people who are going to come down through history, down through the ages, and be a part of his family. So I really think that that is the picture, the spiritual picture, uh, that I think we need to draw from that. Now, if I'm not making sense, let me back up. But is that, is that fitting? All right? So this, God's people are to continue to maintain their witness. They refuse to give in and compromise to the worship of the beast. They're not going to go along with the anti-Christ government, the anti-Christ religions. They're standing strong and living for him. It might mean that they're going to lose their life. But God's telling them, that's okay because you're going to be eternally secure. You've been sealed. You've been marked with me living in you through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And we probably don't say enough about it. And we probably should say more about that. All right. Verse 6 says, There's, I saw another angel flying in midair or in mid heaven." And he has the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. And he said in a loud voice, Fear God, give him glory. The hour of judgment has come. The eternal gospel. What did Jesus say, recorded at the end of Matthew, to all those followers before he ascended? What are they to do? Go. The world. go, go into the world, teaching and baptizing them, right? Making disciples. That's his last command. Words to the church. Get out there and go witness. Be my people. The eternal gospel. Now, it's interesting that in uh, the reign of Augustus Caesar in Asia Minor, in 9 BC, they were celebrating his reign, claiming that since the birthday of the god Augustus was the beginning for the world of the good news, the good tidings, same word, euangelion. And they attached that to Caesar Augustus. What John wants his readers and hearers to know is that it's not Caesar, it's not a Roman emperor that's the giver of good news, it's Jesus. He's the true giver of good news. And that's the eternal gospel for all time that has been proclaimed. John 3.16, right? And those who refuse to believe are going to perish, right? Without him. They're condemned. Um, I know, boy, the tendency today is to... As I've heard some other people say, do church light. Uh, make things fluffy and nice. And, and that's, that's fine to a point. Yes, God is love. Yes, He is gracious. Yes, He is merciful. But I don't think that we can ignore sin, can we? I, I think we need to deal with the truth. And let that truth penetrate the heart so that it can be brought to life. Jesus said, I came to give you life that is more what? more abundant, more full. Well, yeah, you mentioned that ignoring sin before, and uh, I, I was thinking that 
if you ignore sin, you're ignoring Christ. If well, you yes, you are. On the cross, it's all you're. you're because what's the cross all about? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of sin. Isn't that the warfare against sin? Didn't he go there so that we wouldn't have to suffer and God put the weight of the world's sin upon him? Who didn't have any? Yeah. How can you not deal with that? So people are called to repent from the false worship. God's judgment's going to mean an end. His judgment's come. Now, this is the picture. Fear God. Paul in Romans chapter 1 says, the evidence of God should be plain to them, right? As you look around creation, you should see the evidence of God, right? But then they, they refused to do that, he said. And they chose instead to worship the creature. And he describes all that in Romans chapter 1 that ties right into this. And when they determined that they were going to do that, God says, okay, I'll let you have that. And he turned them over to a depraved mind, it says. And they were doing immoral things. Well, what's going on? What's going on around us? Is he saying something like that today, possibly? Saying, well, okay, if that's the way you want it, here's what's going to happen. Here's what, here's what you're going to reap from that. And so, fear God and give Him glory. I sometimes think that maybe, and I know, I mean, a lot of times I've missed that, to have a healthy, genuine reverence, fear for God. He is a holy God. And give Him glory. Sometimes we don't stop enough to just give Him praise. Thank you, God. Thank you for all that you've done in our lives, our family, the church. Worship Him. Notice this in the end of verse 7. Worship Him who made the heavens, <clears throat> the earth and the sea and the springs of water. He's the Creator. He's acknowledged as the Creator. If we don't do that, what are we doing? We're lowering, we're we're, we're coming down to the worship of man, ourselves, <clears throat> or some other being. Okay? So a second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. First time we actually hear about Babylon in Revelation. Fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. How do you take that? <laughs> Do you take that spiritually? <clears throat> yes, because that's the context. Again, tie it back to the letters to the churches and to the message of the prophets in the Old Testament. What were they constantly warning Israel about? Spiritual adultery. Don't commit that. And here it says clear that Babylon, and what is Babylon symbolic of in John's day? What? What power? Rome. 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 Babylon is symbol for Rome in John's day. Now, through history, a whole bunch. You can go backwards to Egypt, <clears throat> to Babylon itself, when they overtook Jerusalem and Judea and Judah, and you could go forward to uh, Greeks, Alexander, on and on through history, you could go with the powers who have had world dominance and have suppressed God's people and other people as well. But fallen. Now, that, it's, it's as if it's already happened, isn't it? The way you're reading it here, isn't it? Fallen. They're fallen. What does that go back to? <clears throat> Let me summarize some things here. Revelation, worship is war. Two groups, those who are marked by God and those who are marked by the beast. The key issue, again, is who you belong to. Who is your Lord? 144,000 were on earth in chapter 7. Now they're in heaven. Jesus is, the picture is as if Jesus has come. We talked about the virgin pact, the, the figurative use, I think, to denote moral and religious purity. Faithful people who refuse to worship the beast and commit spiritual adultery. Big contrast here in the, in the book between Babylon the Great, who is the harlot, uh, and the church, which is the bride of Christ. Okay, so Babylon has fallen. <clears throat> Look at Isaiah 21.9. It 
Behold, here comes riders, horsemen in pairs, and he answered, Fallen, fallen is Babylon. Well, there it is. Isaiah 21, John's borrowing Old Testament, using Old Testament, and all the carved images of her gods, he has shattered to the ground. Babylon is Rome. In John's day, both, both Babylon and Rome destroyed the temple. Babylon destroyed it around 587 B.C. when they carried off captives, ravaged the place, destroyed everything. Rome destroyed it in A.D. 70. Isn't that interesting? Both destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. Now, Egypt sometimes is also used as a symbol for Rome as well. So let's go on and we'll get to this part. <clears throat> so the second angel has announced the destruction of Babylon, which is a symbol for Rome. Now, Rome hasn't been destroyed yet, but it's going to be, <coughs> isn't it? So this is a picture here of God's rule and control uh, over, the, over the, the world. Third angel <clears throat> followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark, there he is again, on his forehead or his hand, <clears throat> he too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. Literally, the two Greek words there that translate the phrase poured full strength, those two words literally come out mixed, unmixed, into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. Goodness, is that in the Bible? I guess so. There it is. That, that sounds pretty strong, doesn't it? Well, the mixed, unmixed, or a poured full strength, the term unmixed means basically it's not diluted with water. Because a lot of the wine in that day and age was diluted with water on different occasions. And then the, uh, the mixed part is the idea of the wine being combined with various spices to make it stronger. So the sense of that passage is that those who have the mark of the beast, those whose character and life are tied to the beast, in other words, if they're going to be earth dwellers, if their life is totally tied to this earth, and their commitment is to the image of the, to the devil and all he stands for, then they're going to encounter God's wrath, full strength. Okay? That's the picture. That's the picture. Anyone receiving this mark, the mark of the beast, is going to encounter the wrath of God. That's not a very pleasant thing. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and his image, or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. The mark of the beast. It's who you belong to, who you're serving. It's a spiritual issue. I have anything to do with any... <laughs> there is nothing physically that anybody can do to you or put on you that's going to keep you from Christ. Romans 8, what can separate us? What? Nothing! Nothing! And nothing the devil can do like that that's going to separate you from Christ. So... Get that picture out of the head. Terry, I'm still having a little trouble with the unmixed and the mixed as to who it relates to. I mean, you're talking. It's about talking about God's wrath. Yeah. The wine, and in just a little bit here, as we go down to the harvest, we're going to talk about the wine press. It's an image, a picture. The, the mixed idea is it's 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 wine that's been mixed in with spices to make it stronger. And the unmixed means it's not diluted down with water. In other words, it's a, it's a way of telling us this is the full impact of God's judgment and wrath. Okay. Oh, okay. The yeah. full impact of His yeah. judgment is coming. There's no watering down. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, in fact, it's enhanced when you get the idea of the spices thrown in there. Okay, that's a good question. Anything else? Now, notice verse 12. What does it call for? Patient endurance. Those who obey God's command and remain faithful to Jesus, it's a spiritual issue. Where did we read that phrase just a little bit ago? 
Back in chapter 13, it says the same thing. The beast idea, the way Satan tries to manipulate through uh, governments, political powers, and religious systems, what does it call for? Patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Listen, is that still true for us now? You better believe it. With all the stuff that's going on to try to discredit Christians, discredit the church, it calls for a lot of patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Same message. It's true today as it was in John's day in the first century. These are spiritual images that convey a spiritual truth. All right? 14. Verse 14. John's looking again. And there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man. Okay, where does that take us back to? Where have we heard that phrase before? Okay, so we've got the wine. One like Son of Man. Is that Jesus or an angel? Yeah, you go back to Daniel 7 again. What does he say? What does Daniel 7 say here? I saw in the night visions of the clouds of heaven. Oh, that's the same kind of terminology. And there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. So that clearly is talking about, about Jesus. Okay? Mark 16, 14, 62, Jesus said, I am and you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Everywhere else in Scripture, the phrase Son of Man is pointing to Jesus. Well, why wouldn't it here? Well, good question. Because then you have it with a crown of gold and a sharp sickle. The crown talks about kingship. The sickle talks about judge, judgment, a judge or judgment. Is he both? Yeah. And then another angel came out of the temple. And in essence, you're getting a picture here of this is really God saying, communicating the message to Jesus, his son, now is the time. Harvest time has come. Now is the time to go. And another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle. In other words, it's as if the message is being communicated to Jesus, this is the hour. Now, we don't know the day or the hour, do we? <laughs> But of course God does, and so now it's being communicated, it's time to go, take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Jesus is harvesting. Now what kind of an image do we get from that? Well, Joel chapter 3. Put in the sickle. Well, the harvest is right. Oh, my. There it is in the Old Testament. John's borrowing from that. Go in and tread, for the winepress is full, the vats overflow, for their evil is corrupted. <coughs> Talking about judgment upon Israel for their what? Spiritual adulteries, idol worship. What's the imagery? Winepress? Right? The sickle? The harvest? Right? Jeremiah 51, 33. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babel is like a threshing floor at the time when it is trodden, yet a little while, and the time of her harvest will come. John's borrowing that imagery, which was in the Old Testament used to refer to judgment, when God was going to bring judgment upon his own people, yes, but also eventually on those who punished his people, like Babylon, Syria, and so forth. So that's the, the imagery here that's going on. Let's finish the chapter here, and then we'll go back and look at a couple of things. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire. Well, that's interesting. Angels must have charge over certain aspects of the world. Here is one who seems to have charge over fire. Earlier we had angels who were in charge of the winds, the four winds. We had one who was charged of the abyss, one under the waters, so there seems to be some 
connection here with angels who have some authority, if you will, over certain aspects. They came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, take your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of grapes from the earth's vine. Because its grapes are ripe, the angel swung his sickle. All the earth gathered its grapes and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. And they were trampled in the winepress outside the city and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of a thousand cubits. Do you really think that's physical? <laughs> In light of everything we've read already. Oh yeah, big sickle, I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is the imagery from Scripture. Matthew 13, the parable of the weeds. If you remember that, Jesus explained it to his followers. Disciples were not sure what that meant. He said the one he explained it. We know this parable. The one who sows is the Son of Man, the fields of the world, the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. And though each are the sons of the evil one, the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather them out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. There it is. Jesus' words in the parable of the weeds. Harvest time. Wine press of God's wrath. He's treading it. He treads that wine press. It's about who you belong to. Harvest time will come. We don't know the hour or the day. The idea of the 1600 stadia is a. What are numbers in Revelation? They are to be what? They're symbolic. They're to be weighed, measured, not literal. But four squared times ten squared. It's an idea of completeness. It's complete judgment. It's going to it's going to happen. So the key here is to be ready. Interesting in that parable, especially the evil ones are snatched out. There is no secret rapture talked about in scripture. We went over that before. Okay. So there's chapter 14.